everyone, we are back here for the first session of our 2020 Virtual Athletic Band Symposium. Uh, it's time for our journey to begin. And so our first session is entitled, The Science, Facts About Our Health and Well-Being. Uh, like many of you, uh, I would like to make some solid decisions for my students based on science, not speculation. Our presenters for this session are going to help us with their specific knowledge today, but also in the near future with major research in our specific profession. So if you would, please help me welcome uh, our two colleagues from the state of Colorado. We have Dr. Shelley Miller, who is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder, and Dr. John Vulkins, professor of mechanical engineering at Colorado State University. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, uh, we can go ahead and get started. And Dr. Miller, would it be okay if we start with you? Sure, that sounds good. Wonderful. I will share my screen. I'm gonna spend a few minutes here talking about how COVID is spread based on the current evidence that's coming through the scientific literature, much of which is just coming out at rapid pace. And a few of the things I talk about today are still in review and preprint. And then I wanna talk about what evidence-based controls we can implement in buildings. That's because one of my main areas of expertise is how to reduce exposures to pollution indoors, including infectious diseases. And so because I'm an engineer, I always like to give solutions to any particular problem that we seem to be facing, even if we are not yet sure which way we're heading these days. So I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about how we know that there are gonna be virus in our respiratory aerosols. A recent study looked at the flu virus, found that only about 0.1 to 1% of viruses exhaled by a person are actually infectious. So we start there and then we try to figure out, well, how many particles are actually coming out when we do respiratory activities, such as coughing, breathing, or even singing. Some older data uh, shows that singing had a count median diameter of 68 microns, which is quite large. Counting means we counted all the particles that came out while a person was singing. However, what was interesting about this study is 34% of the particles were smaller than three microns and 33% were between three and 100 microns. And after 30 minutes of settling, 36% of the emitted droplets were still airborne. A more recent study showed the rate of aerosol emission during vocal activities increases with the loudness of sound. And on the upper right, I'm showing a size distribution of cough, which are droplets from, and they range from 0.1 to greater than 10 microns from a study by Lee et al, 2018. And this study done by Lee et al, 2018 is very similar to the kind of study that we are proposing to do in our chamber at the University of Colorado for music, in, for instrument playing and also musical theater type activities and singing. On the lower diagram, I really appreciate this study because they looked at what was coming out of exhale breath and found that 40% of the aerosol droplets did contain virus DNA. This was done in 2020 and they were testing coronavirus, uh, not, um, not SARS-CoV-2, but still a coronavirus. And, and they did nasal swabs and throat swabs. And they found that when you wore a mask, it actually did drop the particles greater than five coming out of your exhaled breath and also aerosol particles less than five coming out of your breath. But you could still detect these particles in the breath as you were breathing. I've only been able to find one paper that involves any sort of kind of music making. Uh, the, this is the Vavazula, which was used in uh, in the World Cup soccer tournament in South Africa and became quite famous. And one uh, author hypothesized, well, maybe it's generated some particles. And they did find that when you are playing this horn at a sporting event compared to shouting at a, hoarding of, at, a, at a sporting event, you generate a lot more particles. And again, they're in this size range of 0.5 to greater than 10 microns. I wanna share a little bit about how we view uh, how airborne transmission occurs. And here I've kind of categorized it according to one of my colleagues, Yigo Lee in Hong Kong, where we show 
the infectious person on the left who's uh, outlined in red and they are coughing, speaking, talking and generating this large numbers of particles that are of all different sizes. And the size of the particle really determines what happens to it in the environment, as well as, as well as the environmental conditions also impact what's happening to these particles. If there's air currents, if there's humidity, um, it's quite a complex dynamical process. And so if you're close to this person who um, generated this large cloud of droplets, you could inhale either large droplets or small droplets. Um, and we call this either, you know, droplet borne inhalation or short range airborne aerosol inhalation. And then these droplets could also fall on a surface and you could touch the surface and that's a contact transmission route. And then if you're very far away, the small particles can stay airborne for quite a long time and you could conceivably inhale those from far away. Note that in this study, the short range airborne route less than two meters is found to dominate at most distances studied during both coughing and talking. And this is why, you know, the, the six feet or more uh, suggestion for physical distancing is important. We have detected SARS-CoV-2 RNA in air samples and on surfaces. We've seen it in Wuhan hospitals. And this graphic shows where they tried to determine what the particle diameters were in the samples. And again, showing particles of the size 0.25 to 5 microns and then greater than 1 microns. And that helps us as physical and, and aerosol scientists understand, well, what is the dynamics of these particles and where are they going and how easily are they inhaled? We've also seen them on surface of outlet fans for air conditioning and ventilation and in personal and air samples at a Nebraska hospital that was treating patients. What we like to emphasize in my field is that there's compelling evidence to show significant transmission is happening in crowded, poorly ventilated spaces. Uh, a recent paper out of Japan shows the risk of infection is 20 times higher indoors compared to outdoors. And we find clusters of outbreaks happening in Japan in close contact in fitness gyms, hospitals, etc. We've seen them in ski areas and we've seen them in tour shops and churches and also um, in an air conditioned restaurant in, um, in China. And this is a, a CFD a computational fluid dynamic simulation of what happened in this restaurant. The index patient is here in blue and he, had a, he did not have symptoms when he attended this restaurant to celebrate the Chinese New Year with his family. This air conditioning system was not was blowing cool air across this whole side of the room, circulating the droplets through this area. No one else in the restaurant got sick and no staff got sick. Uh, and there was no ventilation in this space at all. Just touching on some evidence-based airborne infectious disease control so that as you plan for your next activities, you might keep these in mind for how you could combat and reduce exposures. Uh, so I'll touch briefly on wearing masks, um, not about washing hands, but we know that's super important. Ventilation rates and distributing the outside air, clean air effectively, using air cleaning is important and minimizing the number of people sharing the same indoor space. I've shown the graphic on the lower right already to you and the, and the graphic on the left just shows the distancing and the masks and how all of this interacts and, and can reduce your exposure risk for um, infection. So masking is, is a really important component of this public health um, approach. We also look at increasing the clean outdoor air supply and the building ventilation has been shown to be as effective as public health interventions. Existing ventilation rates may be too low to prevent airborne infectious disease transmission. And we might even need to increase it by 10 times. I've been doing some modeling uh, exercises uh, myself and we're working on a paper to actually publish these results. And we're modeling a singing outbreak and we estimate that if you increase the loss rates, the ventilation, filtration, et cetera, by a factor of 10, you can decrease the risk from 87% uh, transmission to 22%. And up in the right upper corner, you can see as you increase the ventilation rate to seven air changes per hour, your percent of daily infections goes way down. And again, in the lower right corner, as you increase your air change rate, your attack rate goes down accordingly. 
I also have done a number of studies on upper room air disinfection, and we did a large study for the CDC, which they use to write their guidelines for healthcare facilities to use this technology. And these are lamps that you hang in the upper zone and you keep the people down in the lower zone from being irradiated. These, are, um, these do need to be professionally maintained and installed, and they are important as a, as a control technology for healthcare facilities. We have not tried to implement them in many commercial buildings, um, but it may find there an application at some point in this crisis. Uh, the low pressure mercury vapor lamp emits a wavelength of 254 nanometers that damages uh, the DNA of virus and bacteria. The germicidal effectiveness curve is shown here in light blue when that's where the damage happens and they're unable to replicate. And in our studies, we showed that the UV was upwards of 80% effective at reducing the airborne concentrations of a tuberculosis surrogate, provided that there was mixing in the space. Another study found that among different engineering control measures, UV was the optimal strategy combined with effective isolation and vaccination for containing influenza, measles, and chickenpox. And my last topic is air cleaners. They really do work. You have to know the size you're buying and you have to know a little bit about the flow rates, but there are certification programs like the one I've showed up on the upper left, the AHAM certification program provides you the clean air delivery rate. And this certification is for an air cleaner that can be used in 120 square foot space. And it will reduce tobacco smoke pollen and dust by 80%. And those particle sizes are you know, within the size range of what we see with cough and breathing and singing aerosol. The picture on the lower left is the air cleaner that I purchased at the beginning of the uh, COVID pandemic so that I had an air cleaner in case I needed to quarantine. And on the right is the HEPA filtration efficiency showing just how efficient it is at removing particles of a certain size. And so in summary, there is evidence for airborne transmission. It's, it's uh, highly probable that it's coming from coughs, breathing, singing aerosol that's being generated by asymptomatic or symptomatic people. We must use physical distancing and increasing other uh, engineering and building controls to reduce our risk is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Appreciate that information. And uh, we'll most likely have some time here at the end. I know uh, we brought it up in the chat that if you have some questions for both Dr. Miller and Dr. Vulcans, we'll do our best to uh, get those and we'll ask uh, our wonderful presenters uh, those questions along the way. So we'd like to turn things over to Dr. Vulcans now from Colorado State University. Welcome. Thank you, Barry. And thank you, Shelley, for a wonderful introduction to the topic of aerosols. It's never easy to speak to a, a wide audience on this topic. And I think you did a wonderful job. And it makes my job a lot easier. So let me share my screen now. So yes, you can get a PhD in aerosol physics. And I will build a little bit from Shelley's uh, topics to answer some broader questions and, and hopefully conclude uh, with some more focused uh, questions that we hope to answer in the coming months related especially and particularly to the performing arts and, and to the playing of music and, and singing. I suspect a lot of you are wondering why we don't have more answers here. Why is there so much uncertainty surrounding this virus and viral aerosol transmission and ways to protect ourselves? Um, you're, you're not alone, of course. Um, there's been good data showing that across the US, there's a shortage of medical professionals, especially doctors that we anticipate in, in the coming future. And, and the point I first want to make is that for every 1,000 doctors that graduate from a US medical school, we see probably one new PhD granted in the field of aerosol science. In fact, there are probably fewer than 5,000 uh, what I would call aerosol PhDs actively working in the US. And I know this because I go to all the conferences we hold and our conferences are never more than about six or 700 people that attend. 80% uh, of those PhDs work outside of academia. And what I mean by that is they're not set up in their regular life to conduct research. And probably less than 5% of those PhDs 
study bioaerosols and public health. So we're talking about an extremely small pool of individuals that actually specializes in viral aerosol transmission. And, and you're probably thinking, well, I've seen enough movies. We just need one hero to save the day and you know, run around the, the, the country and, and uh, fire off a silver bullet to stop this. And, and of course, the real world doesn't work that way. And so you're talking today uh, with, with two experts in this field among maybe a, a sample size of 50 people in, across the US that are really adequately prepared to conduct research um, you know, on this problem. Now, I would be remiss as a professor of aerosol physics not to be pedantic for a few minutes and, and just educate everyone a little bit more on the sizes and sources of, of airborne particles. I wanna direct your attention to this axis on the bottom of particle size, uh, which is in micrometers or one millionth of a meter. You're probably not familiar with thinking about particles in this, in this size range. And the first thing to notice is that airborne particles actually span a massive size range, running from just a few nanometers up to 100 microns in, in size. And what's interesting and helpful actually to aerosol physicists like Shelley and myself is that when you tell us the size of a particle, we can typically tell you a lot about how that particle behaves and likely where it came from. So I'll give you some examples of particles we see in, in nature. The first is soil dust. You've driven your car down a dirt road and seen that cloud of dust come up behind your car and it sticks to your windshields and, and you know, windows. Soil dust typically comes in sizes from about oh, 10 to 100 microns uh, in, in diameter. Pollen, on the other hand, which we are inundated with currently here in Colorado, typically varies from maybe just a few microns in size up to 80, 90, 100 microns as well. Usually these are, we would call these very large particles. And yet, even though they're very large, as, as we all know, pollen gets everywhere, right? It covers our cars, our homes, our windows, it gets inside the home, it gives us allergies. And so even these super large particles have the ability to disperse their environment relatively effectively. When you think about factories, the cutting and grinding of metal, uh, fabrication, we get into much smaller particles typically in the, in the one to 10 micron range. And so you see a, a worker here grinding a piece of metal and, and, and generating particles. Typically we'll see those in the oh, half a micron up to about 10 micron particle size range. These are abrasive dusts. And then smoke. Whenever you burn something, you typically make the smallest types of particles that we'll see. Any form of combustion will make these tiny particles less than a micron in size, maybe a, you know, 100 nanometers in size. And so if you tell me I've found you know, these 100 nanometer particles, I, I immediately as an aerosol physicist know something about the source of those particles. And knowing something about the source means that I can probably help predict or control their emissions. Now here's this really annoying piece of machinery that I'm sure you've seen in the national media. That's the COVID-19 Virion. So that's the entire little piece of machinery. And, it, and it's, it is a piece of machinery. Uh, it's not alive. It's just a little device, a little bot that gets inside your cells and, and tells your cells to reproduce them, uh, itself in vast quantity. And of course, that's what makes you sick. It's about 120 nanometers in size or 0.12 microns. So when we think about airborne particles, anything smaller than this 0.1 micron threshold, we actually probably don't need to worry about from a SARS-CoV-2 perspective. Because if you see a particle that has that uh, RNA present, it's likely been fragmented or broken and, the, and if the machine is fragmented, it's not going to work properly. So we think about particles larger than this size and all the way up. What's perhaps amazing and also frustrating about the human body is, as Shelley alluded to earlier, is that we can make particles almost across the entire size spectrum through our regular activities like breathing or talking, sneezing, coughing, uh, and, and singing. And so from an aerosol uh, scientist standpoint, this is difficult because these, the size range spans four orders of magnitude. And for these bioaerosols, we don't quite know the source because they come in all different shapes and sizes. And of course, you're all wondering, 
well, what are the pertinent sizes for musical and vocal arts? I've, I've created this in, in kind of a, a gradient pattern because we don't know the answer to that, but the answer to that is something we are proposing to study in the coming months so that we can hopefully deliver that information. The rule of thumb in, in the study of aerosols is once you know something about the size of the particle, you can predict its behavior and you can control it. And so understanding the size of these particles and the concentration they're emitted is really paramount to developing actionable solutions for the field. So this human bioaerosol spans a huge size range depending on, on what, you're, what you're doing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these particle sizes. So I've drawn here a 0 0.1 micron particle. You can barely see it. It's just a little speck on your screen. That's about the size of one of those SARS-CoV-2 virions. Next to it, I've drawn a, a one micron particle at relative scale. Next to that, I've drawn a 10 micron particle at relative scale. And next to that, I've drawn a 100 micron particle to relative scale. Now, the reason the World Health Organization has us primarily focused on these 10 and 100 micron particles and that six foot distancing rule is that you can pack thousands of these 0.1 micron particles in a 10 or 100 micron droplet. And so if you think about packaging SARS-CoV-2 virions in particles, you get much more bang from your buck in these larger droplets, which means that larger droplets by nature are going to have uh, a, a higher carrying capacity for the virus. If they have a higher carrying capacity, it is likely, though not yet proven, that these particles should be more infective because they can just hold more if one gets into your body. We do know that the number of vir virion copies that you take into your body is strongly related to your probability of infection. Now, something that's interesting about these particle sizes that I've drawn here is that they behave very differently in air. This 0.1 micron particle uh, really doesn't settle out. It, the only way to remove a 0.1 micron particle from the atmosphere is to have it stick to a surface or have it ventilated out of the space. I also wanna point out that when we look at these particle sizes, there is a massive variation. If this 0.1 micron particle were the size of a baseball, this 100 micron particle would be the size of a baseball stadium. That is a difficult proposition from a control technology to tell someone you have to design controls to stop baseballs and baseball stadiums from moving around. That's also what makes the, the study of aerosol physics physics uh, so much fun, of course, for us as well. Now this 0.1 micron particle, as I said before, doesn't really like to be removed uh, from the atmosphere. It's just gonna bounce around and follow the airflow wherever the air goes, and there it goes. A one micron particle, closer to a 0.1 micron particle, it will settle, but only a few millimeters uh, uh, in, a, in minutes, maybe take hours to a day to be uh, settled out of a room due to gravity. So it also will kind of hang around for a long time. The 10 micron particle, that particle will settle. Gravity will pull it out of the atmosphere or out of a room, but on the order of minutes, it will take to have that 10 micron particle settle. And the 100 micron particle, that sucker will drop like a, you know, like a fly in a room. Um, and, and to give you an, an idea of you know, a 100 micron particle, if you're a baker, flour that you cook with, those flour grains are about 100 microns in diameter. So if you take a handful of flour and throw it into a room, you can see how long it takes for that flour cloud that you've created and, and the massive mess, of course, you've created to settle out. But it's usually on the order of, you know, within a minute, all those particles are going to be gone and on the floor. Okay. So these particles of different size have different lifetimes. They also have a different ability to reach uh, into the recesses of your body upon inhalation. But the general thinking in the field is that if a particle can reach your breathing zone, chances are you can inhale it. I'm showing again on the x-axis down here that same particle size range, 0.1 microns up to 100 microns in size. And what I'm showing in this graph is the penetration efficiency or the ability of the particle to be inhaled if it's present in your breathing zone. And your breathing zone is actually a theoretical region. Imagine a bubble 
about 20 centimeters extending around your head. When you take a deep breath, that's where the air is gonna come from. And so this breathing zone really just is a theoretical region in which for each breath of air you draw where that air is going to come from. So we care about your breathing zone because if there are infective particles in your breathing zone, chances are you can inhale them. And what you see from this graph is that almost all of these particles can be inhaled with very high efficiency. Only at the 100 micron size do you see a dip in that inhalation efficiency. It's about 50%. So if there's a 100 micron particle you know, settling around your head because someone threw that handful of flour at you, you're going to inhale about half those particles if you draw breath. That's inhalability. Can the particle pass through your nose or, or your mouth? If you want the particle to penetrate into your lungs, it has to be even smaller than that. And so this blue curve, the thoracic curve that I show, shows whether or not particles can penetrate past your windpipe into your lungs. And the last curve is the respirable curve. Only the smallest particles in the air can get into the deepest recesses of your lungs. These two regions are important because we know that SARS-CoV-2 likes to inhabit the deep parts of your lung. It's a respiratory virus. It, it does the most damage there. And it's likely that if the particles reach that part of your lungs, they're gonna have a higher probability of, of infecting you and, and causing uh, damage over time. But what we don't know yet with, with any certainty, we think we know, but we don't know with certainty, is whether or not we find particles in this one to 10 micron size range that are uh, uh, infective. This is information that we hope will be uh, better elucidated in the coming months. Now I wanna show a short video um, by uh, some authors that were studying hospital containment rooms to look at whether or not you could have air from one room moved to another. Now, you probably don't care about air movement between hospital rooms, but you do care about how air moves around in any indoor space. And the point of this video is to show you tracers of air as someone opens a door and moves from one room to another. You can't see air moving, but this video elucidates that air. And so what you're going to see is this person swing open a door and get slid into the other room. And what I wanna highlight here, and I'll pause it just for a second, the white air, and this is really air, it's, it looks like smoke because the smoke particles behave like air, but this is really just air that's been colored. The white air is air that came from the right room into the left, and the yellow is air that came from the left room into the right, all upon the action of just opening a door and walking through it. So the point I wanna make here is that if you can open a door and walk through it. And after 20 seconds, the air mixing looks like this. If there are particles in that room that are larger than about 10 microns, they're gonna follow those airflow streams and they're gonna get well mixed in that room. This is what we're really concerned about when we talk about infectivity of SARS-CoV-2 in the aerosol in the smaller particle range, because those particles aren't going to be removed effectively through uh, you know, natural uh, gravity. I also like this study and, and it's an open access study. I've, I've put the link down here if you wanna look at it because they did this experiment two ways. This is a computer generated model that we show here. They also actually took a mannequin and that's why they have this kind of artificially be slid across because they took a mannequin and they built a room like this. They filled the door with smoke probably a fog machine, and they pushed the mannequin through and they saw almost exactly similar results to their model, which of course then lends a lot of believability to their computer model that this is uh, a representative uh, situation of what actually happens in a room. So just walking through a room, just being in a room can stir the air up enough that you get pretty good mixing. That's the point I really wanna make here. Okay. So a few thoughts to share looking forward. Um, you're talking to two engineers today and engineering research is almost always designed to produce translational knowledge, which is great. We're not trying to make fundamental discoveries here as much as we're trying to make discoveries that lead to actions. That's really the difference between an engineer and a scientist is that we try and solve problems in the real world. 
We love answering questions just for questions sake, but typically we want to apply our answers to make a difference. And so the research that we propose to do is, is proposed to make translational knowledge or actionable knowledge for you. I want to qualify that though, that research is most of the time unlikely to produce a silver bullet, right? We're not going to be able to eliminate all risk. We're hoping that we can attenuate risk. What is the acceptable level of risk? Well, as public health professionals, we only know about half of what we need right now to make decisive cost-effective recommendations. We can make recommendations that are decisive. Everybody stay home forever, nobody go outside. That's clearly not gonna be cost-effective. But we can't make those cost-effective decisions yet because we just don't have all the answers. Here are a couple questions that I think we need to have answers to that we don't yet. What's the probability of infection if you inhale one, 100 or 10,000 copies of the SARS-CoV-2 virus? We don't actually know that for the aerosol uh, mode or the droplet mode of transmission right now. And once we do know that information, we can start to develop actionable solutions. Another question, how long and intense is the window of viral bioshedding for someone infected with SARS-CoV-2 and how much does this vary by person? There's some evidence coming out that this might be a, a window of maybe five days, but it's not convincing evidence yet. And we need the answers to these questions so that when we conduct our research, our solutions become much more powerful. Now our research is not designed to answer these two questions, but guess what? The entire world is working on answers to these questions right now. And I'm convinced that our recommendations are going to get better over time. I'm also convinced that these two questions are likely to have more answers or more light shed on them in the coming months. And that's a great thing because once we have the answers to these questions, we can start to develop recommendations that are then framed in a risk framework so that you can make a decision based on science and fact. I'll conclude with a little bit of um, recent and related work that's happening in, in our lab at Colorado State, as it's related. Um, my group in general studies air pollution, but I am a mechanical engineer trained in a school of public health. And, and so like Shelley, we are, we are public health engineers. Um, there are very few of us, as I said out there, but we do things like characterize aerosol emissions on a regular basis. We study human exposures, we study health effects, and I in particular like to design and commercialize technology, mostly because I want my ideas to get out into the real world. And, and while publishing academic papers is great, developing something that people can put in their hands and use is usually even more impactful. We've been testing respirators in my lab for the last six weeks uh, with, with great abandon. Um, as, as we all know, there's a shortage of N95 respirators uh, across the, the entire world, but especially in Colorado. Um, there are masks and respirators available, mostly from international suppliers. I'm sure that some of you have dealt with this issue, but they are of unknown quality. And so uh, in late March, the governor of Colorado asked our lab to start testing respirators so that we could provide the state with actionable information on which respirators and which suppliers they should buy from so that they can protect their frontline healthcare workers who are responding to the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. And our lab to date has tested over a hundred different mask designs um, as, of, as of yesterday. And this is just a picture of, of uh, a, a research professor in my lab, Christian Larange, and, and our kind of complicated setup by which we use to test those masks. So we're already doing some research that's similarly related to you know, thinking about controls for, for your industry. You've, I'm sure you've heard of the N95. Uh, N95 means 95% removal efficiency for particles that flow into the mask. You can't get this N95 label unless and only if you have your mask tested at one single federal laboratory in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I have great pity for that laboratory right now because they are absolutely inundated with work trying to certify masks. So most of the masks that are available on the market right now are not N95s, even if the vendors say they are. Um, we follow the, the federal protocol in our lab. And the point I wanna make here is that looks can be very deceiving, right? until you have that actionable information, you just don't know what you're dealing with. Here are four masks that we've tested over the past month. 
Um, they're all kind of those ear loop style masks. And some look different than others. Uh, and and the, the point I wanna make is that it's almost impossible to tell how a mask will perform by looking at it. The two on the left passed our N95 test and the two on the right failed. But of course, this is great information for the state and our stakeholders because we can tell them which vendors to go with to protect their workers. We also do uh, controlled human exposure research. This is a, a project that we just wrapped up in our lab where we brought volunteers uh, into the lab, uh, healthy volunteers under medical supervision to look at uh, what happens when they inhale essentially campfire smoke for about an hour. Um, this, is, this was a research project funded by the National Institutes of Health. It looked primarily at air pollution. But the point I want to make here is that we have facilities, both in, in my lab and at Shelley's lab, to conduct controlled human experimentation, looking at emissions of aerosols and ways to control them. So the good news is we have facilities that are geared up and set to do the type of research that is needed to provide answers to the community. And I'll, I'll end here, and I, and I won't read these, but these are some of the questions that we hope to answer in the coming months so that we can provide actionable information for you and so that we can uh, provide a means or at least a roadmap for you to get back to doing what you love to do. And with that, I will conclude. All right, thank you, Dr. Vulcans. Uh, so we've got some questions from uh, a number of our folks that are here joining us today. And so, um, Shelly, if you don't mind joining us once again, um, would love to ask some questions here from our participants. And again, thank you again for, for your time. Uh, we know you both are extremely busy, especially uh, with the current situation that we're under with a great deal of research. And again, uh, helping us find some great answers for what we want to do with our with our students and programs. So the first question, um, one of the statements was there was a risk of infection 20 times higher indoors and outdoors or 20 times less likely outdoors. Uh, is there still a high risk, relatively speaking, with a large group? Say we've got 200 plus gathering outdoors, even when implementing six foot uh, physical distancing. Um, you know, is this still something to be concerned about? And I know, you know, a lot of this is ongoing and there's still a lot of research to be done on this. But, you know, as some of our colleagues are making some answers or making some decisions uh, for the future, um, you know, kind of each of you, maybe what is your take on this on this question? Okay, well, I guess I'll start. Um, but first, thanks well, John, for a great presentation. I, um, so one of the things that air pollution engineers always say is dilution is the solution to pollution. And that's why for many centuries, we just dumped all our air pollution into the great outdoors. But pretty soon we found that we were emitting too much pollution and causing significant health effects because of that. And we had to implement control strategies to reduce these emissions. So when you think about being outdoors, you can think about uh, all of the potential aerosol being generated by the people outdoors, you know, their aerosol is going to be diluted in the outdoor environment and the concentrations will generally be lower. Um, I get uncomfortable when we talk about large numbers of people because that means the more people that are around, the more possibility that someone within that group is, um, is an infectious person and could even possibly be a super spreader. We do not yet know what, what characteristics detail a super spreader. So, um, so I think that social distancing is important. I think being outdoors is safer. I don't particularly like big crowds right now, <laughs> um, but the wind, and then the next question was wind, which I'll um, pass on to John since he had that great, uh, great video showing what happens when you blow things around. Yeah, so Shelly did a great job answering it. I won't um, bring much more to, to, to answer the question because I think Shelly really covered it. We don't know how much lower the risk is yet um, from an outdoor exposure. We do know that it is reduced and likely by factors, right? Not 10% or 20%, but likely by factors. And a good example is um, smoking or vaping, right? Um, some of you are, are probably old enough to remember watching someone actually smoke indoors, right? And when you smoke a cigarette indoors, how long does it take for that room just to become filled with a cloud of smoke? Almost all of you have probably burned a pizza in your oven. And so you know how long it takes for your kitchen to become full of smoke. 
And so when you have an enclosed environment, that lack of dilution means that not only does the aerosol that's emitted spread quickly, but it also is contained. And so exposure is always going to be higher because of that. When you look at um, one of these poor use outdoors vaping, right? They, they take that big puff in and then they blow that smoke out. You, you watch that smoke dissipate extremely quickly. Now that doesn't mean you can't be outside and say, I can tell someone's smoking a cigarette nearby, right? You can detect that aerosol, but it is, in, it is uh, very strongly diluted. And so the, the answer of course is the risk will be reduced but we don't know by how much. And of course, when you, when you add a matrix or a large amount of people, you are then kind of incrementally increasing the likelihood of that chance infection. It's a, it's a reduced chance though. If I could add one more thing, they asked about this 20 to one number that I put out there, and that's from a paper uh, currently still in review in Japan that investigated over 110 cases among 11 clusters. And they found that, uh, that the odds of a primary case transmitted in a closed environment compared to an outdoor environment was 20 to one. So that was based on, on, on that data set. All right, great. Uh, another question deals with um, kind of just a takeoff of what you just shared in relation to the first question. Does wind, temperature, elevation, humidity, come into play with any of this? Um, obviously, we've got a lot of people tuning in from a variety of places throughout the country and the world. So, you know, are some places more susceptible uh, to the spread of COVID-19 just based on uh, some of those elements? So I can speak to wind. Wind blows small particles around pretty easily. And, you know, particles can be removed from atmosphere under the influence of gravity. But if you have a, a wind blowing around, I try to be upwind of anybody around me because, you know, that that particle source could be blown downwind. Uh, you know, it's it's a really random process as well. Um, and one of our colleagues, Lindsay Marr, is a, a virology aerosol person. And she's done a number of investigations looking at this relative humidity question. You know, a lot of her work is in the lab, uh, but it does show that viruses tend to be more, uh, more active when we're at low humidity for the flu virus in the lab. Uh, now, when you try to change the media in which the virus is suspended, so something a little more like respiratory fluids, you tend to see no, one study showed no input, no humidity effect. And so I think, I think for this particular case, I don't think we know. Yeah, the, um, the humidity one is a, is a tough one. And I completely agree with what Shelley said. The data is not compelling to show that a higher low humidity is, is sufficiently protective or protective to the degree where it would make a, a big difference, right? Because when we talk about lowering risk, we want to lower it by orders of magnitude, factors of 10. We don't think that, that humidity, at least to date, the data shows that we see that sort of change. Um, unless you are uh, practicing in a, in a sauna or in the rain where humidity is north of 90%, the particles that are emitted, the bioaerosol is going to evaporate. Now it doesn't evaporate away completely. It's not like steam where it, where it just you know, turns into water vapor and is gone. What happens is that the water in, in the droplet that you, know, you sneeze or cough out evaporates and it happens usually on the order of seconds. Um, but then whatever's left stays behind. It's usually some sort of salt crystal um, because your, your body has a lot of salt in it. And, and so those are the particles that remain. Um, the smaller particles tend to tend to be able to live and travel longer because the larger particles will settle out due to gravity. Um, beyond that, we can't provide a, a whole lot of insight into, into the processes. All right, great, thank you. Um, another question that continues to come up, and I know both of you have worked on this extensively as well uh, with recommendations. Um, you know, general ventilation rates in rooms and getting rid of aerosols. And I think, you know, even further, some mitigation strategies. You know, a lot of our folks are going to be speaking with administrators or already in that process of speaking with administrators, public schools, you know, the collegiate level. 
Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about UV light, and we know that there's specific UV light, possibly. Uh, you know, so maybe if you want to speak to that, um, HEPA air filters, you know, any guidance on those specific products that as we're sharing information and specifically, you know, so much of this research with our administrators that you can share with our with our listeners. I don't know. I'll, I guess we'll just always go in this order, John. Sorry. <laughs> um, just makes it easier for who's speaking first. Um, the ventilation question is really important. And I would say for the U.S. that one of the best places to go is, you know, your your facilities managers and your mechanical engineers have a good handle on what the ventilation rates are for your practice spaces. Uh, so they are going to be able to be the ones to provide you that information. They follow most, they should be following ASHRAE guidelines, which tells uh, tells construction and building managers what kind of ventilation rates should be provided for what kinds of spaces. Uh, in, for example, when we looked at a um, fellowship hall for a church and we used the ASHRAE guidelines, they recommended the, roughly um, what equated to five air changes per hour in that space if we use the ASHRAE guidelines. So there is information out there. I think your facilities managers need to help you with, with understanding what that means for you. And, and generally speaking, from a building scientist point of view, we think for infectious disease transmission, the rates are generally too low, um, but it depends on your space. And then I'll, I'll let John talk about ventilation and we can have a conversation about uh, ultraviolet light next, if you would like. Yes, um, more ventilation is always good and HEPA filtration is always going to be helpful as well. The, the issue that I think we're going to run into is achieving what I would call a standard of practice um, across our campuses. And that's because at, at Colorado State, we have buildings that span 150 years of history, right? And so uh, I can sit here and say, every room is going to need to have 10 air changes per hour. And an air change per hour is you know, how often that air is, is approximately circulated in and out of the room uh, or more, right? And, and you get into 20 air changes per hour in, in kind of infection control environments or, or at least um, clinical care environments. And the, likely the answer we're gonna get from our university facilities engineers is, well, that's great. I can do it in 5% of the rooms on campus and these rooms that were built in 1892, we can open the windows and people will you know, refuse to work there in winter. So we're gonna run into challenges achieving a standard of practice, but that doesn't mean that more ventilation is inevitable. It absolutely is. And so is filtration. With filtration, as Shelley alluded to earlier, it's the clean air delivery rate of the filtration device relative to the size of the room. And so how, how much air is that filter pulling through it relative to the size of the room? Those are calculations that facilities folks at the university uh, are, are well trained to, to make. And then the last comment uh, I'll make, and I'll let Shelly speak to the UV disinfection, she's really the expert in that area, is um, ASHRAE stands for the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. So A-S-H-R-A-E is the acronym to look up. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, engineers love our acronyms. Uh, briefly, what I can say about germicidal UV is that when we're talking about adding lamps to a space, I promote considering why you're doing that. Ask the question, what's the, what's the purpose? If you have a space that you cannot guarantee, and we're, we're discussing this right now at CU Boulder, if you cannot guarantee that the ventilation rates are going to be high enough, if you can't guarantee that the it's not going to be overcrowded, if you can't guarantee that you don't know whether someone's sick in that space, you know, all of these things add together to promote a, you know, a high risk of transmission, then these are the kinds of spaces you that we are looking at to add supplemental engineering technology, which could include in-room air cleaners and it could include upper room U germicidal UV. Um, you know, it's not something you throw around um, just willy nilly because it is an engineering technology, just like a ventilation system. You need to maintain it. You need to make sure it's safe. And, uh, and so there are really good applications in my mind. We have seen it used in other, uh, other areas like homeless shelters and, and jails to keep disease transmission down. 
um, from unsuspected cases happening. So, you know, that's why we are having a conversation about, well, is it useful here? And it depends on what the space is used for and the risk of transmission. Great. I think we've got time for one more, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, let's talk that, you know, a the nature of some of our ensembles is travel. Um, and obviously travel has been put to a stop here uh, the past several months. Um, but as, as our colleagues are making plans, you know, as we look at travel on buses, planes, you know, are there any, any type of unofficial or official advice that you have on that from the scientific research? You know, obviously we're dealing with students that are gonna be in close proximity when we look at school buses or charter buses, uh, planes themselves. Um, you know, as we look at that in terms of just some protocols with regard to travel and any safety measures uh, when we're dealing with our students. So I do know a couple of my colleagues are analyzing some data on bus outbreaks that have happened around the world. I don't know what the conclusions are from those studies. Uh, we have, in the air pollution community, we, we have done a lot of research on vehicles because uh, vehicles are in high, pla high places of, are in places of high air pollution. You know, traffic is a big air pollution uh, generation. And, and, and so we study a little bit about tra transportation, but not necessarily from the infectious disease standpoint. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what I told my transportation people when we talked was that I want everyone on the bus I'm on to have a mask on, and I would recommend you cut the ridership by, you know, by half, you know, I'm just, uh, these are some suggestions we are discussing on our buses on our campus. And, and that's mostly what I can say at this point. What do you think, John? Yeah, I would agree. Masks um, are gonna be helpful uh, in, in that sort of environment. When you think about infection probability, you, you've got kind of three factors, right? You've got um, exposure, whether the exposure is happening or not and the intensity of it. You've got proximity to that source of exposure, the distance you are away, and then you've got time. And of course, in a closed environment like a bus, if someone's infected, you've kind of got the worst case scenario because you've got a lot of time, you've got exposure and you've got proximity. And so those are the three things that need to come together to, to promote you know, probability of infection. Um, however, there are likely ways to lower that probability. Ventilation in, in the car or bus could be one great thing. Spacing is, as um, Shelly indicated, another one. And then um, controlling the exposure itself at the source, which would be, which would be you know, wearing of masks. Um, ma cloth masks, I can tell you from our research, are not effective at stopping most of the smaller particles. But they are very effective at stopping the larger particles, the droplets, the you know, the kind of um, vocal spit that comes out when we talk. And so we know that cloth masks not only protect the wearer from those particles in the environment, but they protect the environment from the wearer if they're infected. And so any mask is going to have some level of protection. And we think that these N95 masks, these high efficiency masks are, are likely not going to be available, but, you know, I can cross my fingers and hope that the, the world starts producing them and hundred times more quantity, they'll be even more effective at, at preventing that sort of transmission. And so um, the reason, you know, both Shelly and I are saying these are ideas and suggestions is that we have not studied and modeled these phenomenon. And we still do not know the answer to the questions of if a 10 micron particle, uh, you know, has a, a significant probability of causing an infection or not, or what the size of the particle really needs to be. Once we have the answers to those questions, and I do think they will be forthcoming in the next few months, our models are gonna get much more stronger in their ability to give confident recommendations. Great, thank you both. Again, this has just been absolutely outstanding information. And I know that uh, there's gonna be much more information coming from both of you, as well as other universities involved in the research. Um, just so important to, to our profession and what we do and just uh, the, our livelihood as well. So we appreciate your time. We appreciate all of the expert advice. And uh, I know we've got some other questions. So thank you for those questions that have come through. And thank you for taking the time to answer questions from everybody. And uh, we just, again, sincerely appreciate your time. So um, Mark, anything else that you'd like to add from your perspective before we take a break? 
No, I was just going to say that uh, we, we're really grateful for your expertise, both of you, and um, we're looking forward to getting the answers to some of these questions that uh, we don't have answers to yet, so we can all get back uh, to, to the world of making music, which is where we want to be shortly. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. We hope to get you there soon, or at least help. Thank you again, Shelly and John and everyone else. We're going to take a little break here. We'll join you again at the top of the hour. Uh, and we're going to be moving on to the CBDNA perspective of covering all of our bases.